Hi, so welcome back to my YouTube channel. In case this is the first time you're stopping by, my name is Insura Premium and on this channel we share lecture videos on the professional courses relating to ACCA UK, ICAG Ghana, ICANN Nigeria, SEMA UK and other professional qualification examination. We also have content relating to students studying accounting and finance on the first degree HND or doing your MBA, your MSc in accounting and finance, definitely there are content on the channel that will enable you to pass the examination. Remember that I release new videos every weekday at 4.30 p.m. Either it's going to be a live stream or it will be video premiering like this so that I can assist you so you prepare well for the examination and most importantly, become successful. On today's broadcast, we want to share with you a few things that you need to take into consideration and how you need to prepare in order for you to pass the the principles of taxation examination or the advanced taxation exams. Now, this subject is very critical, very important, but most importantly, students have a number of challenges relating to the principles of taxation, which is the level two, or the advanced taxation, which is the level three. But I want to share with you the key issues that you have to focus on, the key areas that you need to optimize yourself in if you want to put yourself in that spot to be able to pass the examination. You ready for that? Let me know. Put in the comment section any topics that you would want me to share my thought on on these uh, papers either principles of taxation level two or the advanced taxation paper in level three let me know if there are any topics that you have problems with that you have challenge with that you would want me to share my thought on i will gladly have a, another video or do a live stream session where i will treat those topics for you so you can prepare well for the examination and pass the exams now one of the key things that you need to understand is that if you want to pass the principles of taxation exams or the advanced taxation exams there are very basic basic principles, very basic concepts that you need to take into consideration or that you need to be aware of. So if you are going into any of these exams, definitely primarily the law is going to be very critical. So the Income Tax Act 2019, Act 1007, I think so, uh, it's going to be the primary rule, but then that is going to be backed what with the um, Income Tax Act 2015, Act 896, as amended. That is how probably the examiner is going to be quoting that up. So there are a lot of things in the Act that is going to be fundamental for you to go into the examination. Now, before I get into the key areas that you have to focus on, let me share with you some of the concerns of the chief examiner relating to their paper on uh, principles of taxation. The first thing that you need to understand about principles of taxation and advanced taxation also is that any question that you are solving, especially if it is a computational question, you need to make sure that you write the name of the taxpayer or the entity in the question that is very critical, that is very basic, you're going to get a tick for that, and that is going to contribute in to whether you pass the exams or you fail the exams. So the name of the person whose tax returns or whose tax liability we are calculating, either a company or an individual, you want to make sure that you make that available or you write that down. The second thing is also going to be the year of assessment in the question. That is always going to be there. Maybe calculate the income tax liability of a uh, Sally, for the year ended, uh, for the year of assessment 2020. So you must write that down. Very important. It's very critical because the examiner is going to be awarding you marks with that. Then the third thing is that you see principles of taxation and advanced taxation. Sometimes there are certain questions that are subject to various assumptions that can be used in arriving at your figures. For instance, if there are things such as uh, corporate tax liabilities and there are certain items in the expense there are certain items that may be allowable, certain items are non-allowable. But now there are certain items that are non-allowable, but if the question contextualizes it, it can become an allowable expenses in that regard. But then sometimes there are certain items you don't know whether you should allow it, whether you should not allow it, because there are no further details surrounding it. The chief examiner has consistently stated that whatever ex assumption you're going to be using in the computation, in your calculation, you must make sure that you explain or you justify why you use certain figures, why you included certain figures, or why you excluded certain figures, because that is going to be going to, uh, through a long way in order for you to 
pass the examination. So let's say, for instance, you are working at the income tax liabilities of individuals and you are including something or you are excluding something, there has to be a briefing note after your computation justifying why certain things were included and certain things were not included. The same thing applies to corporate tax liabilities also. That is going to be critical there. You are going to state why you allowed certain expenses, how, why you disallow certain expenses, why you are grossing up certain amounts, why you are taking up certain amounts, why you did not include certain things, why you excluded certain things. All these assumptions that you use in the preparation or your computation must be justified and explained in a briefing note to your solution because that helps the examiner to really understand what you're doing and that helps the examiner to also know that you actually understand what you are doing as you are preparing the various uh, statements for the taxpayer. So these are three key things that I want you to take into consideration very well whether you are doing principles of taxation or the advanced taxation examination. Now, if you're doing advanced taxation, you can check the description of this video. There are various timestamps available, and you can click and then move on to the timestamp relating to advanced taxation. But if you're doing principles of taxation, let's get excited and let's begin with the journey. Now, in principles of taxation, there are key areas we have to focus on in order for us to pass the examination. Key areas. Number one, whether I like it or not, there is going to be a question on that. It's going to be income tax liabilities of individuals and partnership. There is a 20 mark question waiting for us in the exam hall and you have to be mindful of the treatment of the various issues. Now the distinction here is that when someone is in unemployment, the computation is going to be a little bit different if you are dealing with a self-employed individual. And then the computation is going to be also a little bit different if you are dealing with a partnership of a partnership business. Be mindful of the fact that partnership businesses do not pay tax. Instead, the partners are responsible for their tax liabilities. So at the end of the day, what is going to be happening is that we will get a chargeable income of the uh, business or we've got a uh, profit for the business taking into consideration definitely issues about depreciation and capital allowance then we were going to be sharing that profit between the partners in their profit sharing ratio and then whatever benefit that the partners receive directly are going to be included in their income tax for the period under review or their chargeable income for the period under review. So whatever benefits they receive, be it salary, be it interest on uh, capital, whatever benefit they receive from the partnership business, it is treated as distribution of profit for that reason shall be subject to tax uh, in that case. Then also, if any of the partners have any uh, you know, personal relief is going to be coming in here because it's going to be very critical. If the person is in unemployment, then you know social security contribution is going to be a fundamental or default relief at this level. But if the person is self-employed, uh, then we would have to know that the, we would have to do the deal with reliefs if the examiner states it that, oh, maybe the person contributes to a pension or maybe the person contributes to a provident fund, maybe the person uh, has children, the children are in uh, school, and so you have to know the various personal reliefs that are available. We have the social security contribution, we have the educa child education relief, we have the marriage and responsibility relief. We got, you can see that on your screen uh, here. We're going to put that on the screen so that you'll be able to see all the relief. Then we have the disability relief as well for people with who are physically challenged or disabled so that we give them those relief to get their taxes payable at the end of the day. So when you are dealing with income tax liabilities of individuals, you have to pay attention to that very well. If the person is in unemployment or the person is a partner, uh, that we are dealing with partnership or partners of a partnership business or you are dealing with a self-employed person, sometimes the examiner can merge the two together where the individual is getting money from employment partly and then some income are coming also from employment investment, then some income are coming in also from their self-employed businesses or activities. Your responsibility or your assignment is to be able to know how to deal with various treatments relating to those scenarios in order for you to position yourself to pass the examination. So that is the first done deal critical area that you must understand as you go into the examination. 
The second critical thing that you need to understand is going to be the issue about capital allowance. Now, let me state this, that uh, the examiner has two options relating to capital allowance. Number one is that either the examiner is going to have a dedicated question on capital allowance for 10 marks uh, or 15 marks for you to answer, or the examiner is going to be bringing in as part of the income tax liabilities of individuals or partnership or even corporate tax liabilities, which is the third key thing you need to pay attention to. So I want you to make sure that you understand the principles that underline the treatment of capital allowance, the various classes of assets from class 1 to class 5. Be mindful of the fact that assets from class 1 to class 5 are granted capital allowance on a reducing balance basis. Class 4, class 1 to 3 are on a reducing balance basis. Class 4 and 5 are on a straight line basis. Then you have to know the various asset classes that are recognized in the class 1, in the class 2, in the class 3, in the class 4, in the class 5, and the appropriate percentages that are going to be applicable. So we have class 1, 40%, class 2, 30%, class 3, 20%, class 4, 10%, class 5, also 10%, or using the economic useful life of the asset or over a period of five years. In that case, so you need to be mindful of whatever is going on in the question. Then also, you pay attention to the uh, theories relating to uh, capital allowance, the conditions under which capital allowance may be granted, uh, the processes involved in uh, taking capital allowance, and then the various computations. So either the examiner will bring a dedicated question on that, or the examiner will bury that in the income tax liabilities of individuals and partnership, or better still, corporate tax liabilities. What I'm saying here is that before you go into the exam hall, make sure you understand the principles that underline the treatment of the various items, various assets relating to capital allowance. That is the second key thing that you need to understand. Number three, I made mention of this a moment ago, and that is corporate tax liabilities. Corporate tax liabilities. There's a 20 mark question waiting for us in the exam hall, but then corporate tax liabilities is a broad area that has a lot of issues that you have to be mindful of. Number one, you have to know how to distinguish between allowable and non-allowable deductions. Very, very important. Number two, you must know how to deal with interest expenses using the principle of thin capitalization when loans is taken by a resident entity from a non-resident uh, entity. You must know how to deal with uh, the interest on the loan and foreign exchange using the thin capitalization concept. You must know how to deal with issues about financial cost and financial gain. That is very, very critical. This is where you're going to be using the principle of the whether they can uh, write it off a gains in the mining sector or they can uh, use the principle of the uh, financial gain plus 50% of the adjusted chargeable income. These are all principles that you must be mindful of. So the thin capitalization concept, very critical. Treatment of financial costs, financial gain, very critical. Carry over of losses, very critical. Especially if we are in a priority sector, the losses can be carried forward for five years. If the entity is not a priority sector, losses can be carried over 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 for a period of just three years in that case. So you have to be mindful of even what the priority sectors are, like waste processing, like IT, uh, like agro uh, processing. Uh, those things are going to be uh, priority sectors. Export of non-traditional uh, products or goods, uh, that is also going to be another uh, priority sector that you have to be uh, mindful of. So when it comes to corporate tax liabilities, it's very critical for you to understand those various principles. Then the treatment of uh, repairs and improvements. I mean, the repairs and improvement that is going to be allowable for tax purposes shall not exceed 5% of the written down value of the asset. That is going to be critical. So you must understand how those principles actually in corporate tax liabilities come together and actually are applicable for you to be able to pass the examination. So keenly, you must know what we mean by allowable and non-allowable deduction so that you know the things that you are going to be added back in that regard. Then you must know the taxation of dividends, taxation of various other receipts that companies have as they are receiving various income and undertaking various activities as an entity. You must know what is allowable and what is non-allowable. And that is the third thing that you must understand when we talk about corporate 
uh, sorry, when we talk about principles of taxation, very critical, very basic. If you are getting some value, give us a thumbs up on the video. Remember to subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. And also remember to share the video so that you can reach a lot of students. So together we can assist a lot of people studying and preparing for the examination. So together we can make the world a better place. You ready? Let's move on to the next one. Now, the fourth thing that is going to be basic for our examination is going to be value-added tax. This is very huge area. Definitely, there is a question waiting for us in the exam hall for value-added tax administration. Now, how do we calculate the VAT at the end of the day? Remember, there are two uh, issues about VAT broadly that you need to understand. We have the standard VAT system, the 12.5% system, and then we have the flat rate system, which is the 4%, 3% for the VAT, 1% for the COVID-19 levy that you must know about. Then when we come to the standard VAT system, remember that we're going to be having the NHIL 2.5 added to the value of the goods. Uh, we're going to have get fund 2.5 added to the value of the goods. Then we're going to have the COVID-19 1% also added to the value of the goods. Then we get a gross amount exclusive of VAT. Then the VAT 12.5% will be applied on that particular figure in that case. So you have to be mindful of the way the VAT computation is done. But also pay attention to the fact that when you're dealing with VAT, there is what we refer to as VAT withholding. Now, that is different from withholding tax administration. VAT withholding is different from withholding tax administration. So you make sure that you know the distinction between the two. Then also you must understand the various issues about who can register for VAT. There are obligations uh, standardized. There are certain entities by law they are supposed to register for VAT. There are certain entities voluntarily they can register for VAT and there are requirements that must be met. Then the various types of supply taxable supply, exam supply, relief supply, um, mixed supply, and then uh, the zero rated supply. So these are the five types of supply. You must know them and know the examples that relates to them very, very well. Because VAT administration, whether I like it or not, it's going to be in the exam hall. Pay attention to the computations aspect very well. Understand the various issues about how we arrive at the um, uh, a tax invoice for a product, both from the standard rated system or from the flat rate system in that case. And also make sure that you understand the concept of withholding VAT. Like I mentioned, there's a difference between withholding VAT and withholding tax. Now, when it comes to the concept of withholding tax, another key area that you have to pay attention to, we are going to be having questions, or depending on the way the examiner is excited, for goods, works, and services exceeding 2,000 Ghana cities, then there has to be a withholding uh, tax if the entity we are selling to is a VAT withholding agent. So make sure that you understand the principles that underline withholding tax when dividends are also being paid and then we hold less than 25% of their controlling interest in the company, then certainly the entity paying the dividend would withhold a tax of 8% in that case. Then also when we are paying interest uh, to a non-resident entity from whom we borrowed money, when I was explaining to you the thin capitalization concept a moment ago, we have to know how we charge a withholding tax of 8% on that interest that we are paying to them because that withholding tax must be withheld so that it will be remitted to the Ghana Revenue Authority. So value-added tax, withholding tax administration, very, very critical, and you must understand the way the principles are guided together or put together in order for you to pass the examination. So income tax liabilities of individuals and partners, issues in relation to uh, corporate tax uh, capital allowance, three, corporate tax liabilities, four, value-added tax administration, five, withholding tax administration, six, that is going to be very critical, is going to be the three-tier uh, pension scheme of Ghana. Very basic. Almost every semester, the examiner tries to bring something there. Broadly, there are two types of pension schemes that are available as per the Act. That is the defined benefits contribution, defined benefit scheme, and then the defined contribution scheme. You must know the distinction uh, between the two. Then also, you must know the mechanism of the three-tier system. The tier one has to do with what both the employer and the employee pays. So usually, the employer is going to pay 13 percent. The employee pays. 0.5% and that amount is the first year. It's mandatory, it's compulsory. Then we come to the second year, which is what the employee is going to be paying. That is also going to be mandatory and that is 5%. 
and the employee is going to be getting relief for all these things, the first year and the second year. Then we have the third year, and that is the voluntary contribution into Provident Fund or any other private pension fund approved by the National Pension Authority. Uh, you can contribute into that fund. And also for relief purposes, the taxpayer can get up to fifty, sorry, 16.5% of that as a relief in that case. Now, that contribution into the Provident Fund can be done solely by the employee or by the employer or the two, by the employer and the employee into that Provident Fund. And, and that is optional, and you can get up to 16.5% of the basic salary for the contribution that are made into the Provident Fund as a relief. So the three-tier pension scheme, oh, you must make sure you understand it very well as well because the examiner is going to be bringing something about that. Then also... The roles of the National Pension Regulatory Authority, the authority mandated uh, to uh, pre uh, to monitor and also regulate pension administration in Ghana, you must understand their function. And I believe that you have gone through these already. And that is a key area that we need to pay attention to as well. Then the seventh thing that we need to understand will be the issue about chargeable gains. I cannot overemphasize the importance of these because definitely it is going to be in the exam hall for us, chargeable gains. Now, chargeable gains is usually divided into two. This is where we are dealing with the gift tax and then capital gain tax. Under gift tax, the issue is that once you are receiving gift from somebody who is not close relative, then you are supposed to pay a gift tax. Please know that there is no longer the 50 Ghana cities benchmark available. Now, whatever gift you receive, you are supposed to file a tax returns on that at a rate of 15%. But know that not all gifts are exempted, are going to be subject to the gift tax. There are certain gifts that are going to be exempted from tax. For instance, gifts uh, that arise from the uh, transfer of assets between spouses or between uh, parents and children uh, is going to be exempted from tax. Uh, nephews, nieces is also going to be exempted from tax. And like I say all the time, probably this is an area that government must look at instead of looking at issues like e-levy and all those things. Because if you look at the gift tax, gifts that people receive in uh, uh, for their wedding, for their uh, um various uh, activities they are literally selling uh, in that regard so whatever inflow that generates that they generate from that activity i believe that it's amount to gift tax and 15 percent of that will really be a huge savings that will go and help the government in order to uh, really build the economy and get a revenue that it wants at the end of the day now that is just by the way uh, though but then that is a concept about gift tax. But then closely related to gift tax is also what we call the uh, capital gain tax. When you buy a property, uh, you buy shares, uh, you buy any capital asset, and later on you dispose of that asset, any gain you make on that asset must also be subject to a withholding tax must also be subject to a tax of 15%. So you must know the mechanism of that very well. However, when it comes to the capital gain tax, there is what we refer to as the rollover relief. Now, the concept of the rollover relief is that if, for instance, during the same year of assessment, I sell an asset, I make a gain though, but then proceeds of that asset, I use either part or all the amount to acquire another capital asset, then I'm going to be getting what? What is called a rollover relief. And so my capital gains tax payable is going to be reduced. Remember to look at questions relating to that very well because that is also very basic in that case. Then filing for returns or tax returns relating to gift tax and capital gain tax, the requirements there, you want to make sure that you understand them very well because the examiner, either gift or capital gain tax, is going to be there as well in the exam hall. Then the last but one portion is going to be tax administration in Ghana. Definitely there is going to be a question. Now that is one of the broadest areas that you need to actually read on if you are doing principles of taxation. It's broad, uh, but then you need to make sure that you exhaust as much as possible the role of the Ghana Revenue Authority, the governing structure of the Ghana Revenue Authority, um, the various problems government encounters in administration of tax, the various uh, principles that governs uh, tax systems, 
self-assessment, uh, provisional assessment, the advantages, the disadvantages. All these are issues relating to tax administration, and you don't want to screw it up. You want to make sure that you read that very well. It's, it's a lot, but then you want to make sure you read that very well and familiarize yourself with some of the principles as you go into the exam hall in that case. So that is the issue you must understand when we talk about tax administration in Ghana. And then certainly the last thing is going to be fiscal policy. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a minute area in the syllabus, but the examiner has always been excited to bring some questions between five or ten mark question, uh, uh, between five to ten mark question for that in the exam hall. So you want to make sure that you go through that also really well. Uh, the various uh, fiscal policy tools like taxation, like public debt, like government spending, these are all things that you must understand. The auto stabilization, uh, the issue about cont uh, contractionary fiscal policy, expansionary fiscal policies, you must understand these things very well. And they are very simple, very direct, very straightforward. You read, scan, read them very very well and you should be in a position to be able to pass the examination so when it comes to principles of taxation broadly these are the things that you need to look out for now if you watch closely and you listen you listened uh, carefully you realize that I have mentioned almost everything in the syllabus because you see what the examiner tries to do is that almost every semester he tries to as much as possible cover major aspects of the syllabus with the goal of about between 90 to uh, 98 percent so he wants to give students options to be able to really look at all aspects so anybody who is able to cover fairly all the aspects of the syllabus will be in a better position to pass the examination. So I don't want you to pick and choose and say, hey, I'm going to focus on this, focus on that, focus on that, da, da, da. No, you want to make sure that you spread your wings because the examiner is going to try as much as possible between 90 to 98 percent to cover the entire syllabus so that you can get various options in the question so you can pass the examination. So that is it about principles of taxation. Stay with me or you can check the timestamp below because I'm going to be giving you the way you are supposed to answer the questions in the exam hall. So either you stay with me to continue or you check the timestamp in the description of the video and click on that to skip to that part of the video there. Advanced taxation. Now, I tell my student that advanced taxation is one of the most interesting areas and a very technical area that you need to look out for if you are going into the exam hall. What are the key topics, the key uh, areas that we have to focus on if we want to pass the advanced taxation examination? What are the key areas? Number one is going to be the issue about corporate tax liabilities and capital allowance. At the bottom, or the primarily, or the primary thing you must understand is that corporate tax liabilities is very critical here. So as you go into the exam, or the same issue you learn in corporate tax liabilities in level two, we're going to be bumping it up a little bit with some few things coming in here. Then the capital allowance also, the issue is going to be very critical here. But as you're learning corporate tax liabilities, there are a few minor issues that you need to take into consideration. Like I mentioned, capital allowance is going to be critical there. Treatment of financial cost and financial gain, very critical, both from the mining and oil exploration perspective and as well as for traditional companies. You must know the treatment of uh, interest expenses using the thin capitalization concept when a loan is taken from by a resident company from a non-resident company. Uh, from a non-resident entity, you must be mindful of that and take note of that very well. Expenses that are allowable, expenses that are non-allowable, you must take care of that very, very well. Then another key area is going to be mining and oil exploration. Very critical. One of them will be in the exam hall, or if the examiner is excited, the two will be there. Now, it's not an area that is lengthy or bulky, so I recommend that you read everything that you must, you can, especially the regulatory requirements for mining and oil exploration, the treatment of the various sources of revenue that governments get from, the, uh, from natural resources, uh, surface rental, additional oil entitlement, participating interest, carried interest, uh, royalties, and all those things. Please note that for the purpose of your examination, anytime the examiner access to calculate royalties, we're going to use 5% either on the number of barrels of petrol uh, that has been uh, produced during the year or period under review, or the value of the petrol that has been sold for the period. If we are dealing with mining, then it's going to still be 5% on 
on the ounces of gold or whatever it is that we are bringing in or the value of it that we are bringing in. So for the purpose of the exams, royalty should be 5%. The reason is that in practice, per the uh, petroleum agreements, various petroleum agreements signed, b signed between the government of Ghana and various contractors, the rates can vary. But for the purpose of your exams, you're going to stay at 5%. So mining and oil exploration, very critical, very basic. There is a question waiting for us in the exam hall, and you have to be mindful to know about that very, very well. I cannot, I cannot overemphasize the importance of that. So corporate tax liabilities, capital allowance, mining and oil exploration. The fourth one is a very huge area, and you're going to be having probably a minimum of 40% coming in from the exam hall, and that is what I call broadly at standard tax planning measures. Now, this is where you're going to be looking at various issues such as measures, and acquisitions, what are the tax planning uh, in that regard? Changes in ownership, what are the tax planning? Transfer, what are the tax planning? What are the tax incentives available for tree crop farming, agro processing, location incentive, industry incentive, uh, priority sector incentive? There are questions coming in there uh, from there. What if, what if an investor wants to go into free zone as compared to traditional companies? What are the tax incentives available? So at this level, tax planning is going to be critical because you are coming out as a professional who is going to assist companies in making various professional or investment decisions. But then every investment decision we are making, we want to find out what are the tax benefits that we are going to get. Because, hey, remember, tax evasion is illegal, but tax avoidance is pretty legal. And so we want to find out what are the loopholes available in the Tax Act? What are the various incentives provided by the Ghana Investment uh, Promotion Councils Act and the various uh, legislations by government for businesses going into various sectors of the economy and what are the tax rules that governs various operations of various sectors. There are location incentives, there are priority business incentives. So you must know all of these things and um, as, as I say this, you, you, you can see that uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting area and it's one of the areas in advanced taxation that I'm excited about because it has a lot of principles there and if you're not mindful of the principles, you're going to screw it up there. Right. If you're not mindful of the principles, you're going to screw it up there. So you want to make sure that you understand these principles very, very well. So let's say, for instance, the examiner can pull up a scenario and say, Sally has been in Dubai for the last 10 years and has got some money and she has come down to Ghana to invest. Uh, Sally is contemplating entering into the free zone enterprises or going into agro processing or thinking about locating the business either in Accra or in Tamale or in locating the business either in Akemoda or in um Shukura uh, in Accra like what are the tax incentives available that is where your brain must open up all right that is where your brain must open up to be able to tell the investor okay if you invest in Accra if you invest in the free zone if you invest in uh, this company these are the tax incentive available these are the obligations that you have to know about very critical very basic and so this is where your deeper level of understanding about advanced taxation is going to be playing a key role and you want to make sure that you understand that pretty well before you get to the exam hall then another critical thing is that for instance a foreign company company want to have a presence in Ghana, there are two options available for that company. They can establish an independent entity so that the entity becomes a resident company, or they can establish what we refer to as a permanent establishment. So you must know the tax principles that governs permanent establishment and then uh, non-resident uh, entities in Ghana and look at the various options that they are supposed to go for and which one will be favorable uh, to the investor at the end of the day. These are all principles that underline standard tax planning measures. For instance, if we decide to employ graduates, what are the tax incentives available to us? And there are tax incentives for the employment of graduates. If we decide to uh, go into agro-processing, there are tax incentives there. When we decide to go into uh, waste processing, Processing. There are tax incentives there. When we decide to go to tree crop farming, uh, there is going to be incentive there. When we decide to go into um, 
cash crop farming, rearing of cattle, there are tax incentives there. So when it comes to tax planning measures, it's a broad area. And the examiner is going to be bringing us a minimum of about 40% of questions and you want to make sure that you know them very well. Then another thing also that relates to that is the concept of transfer pricing. Very, very critical because we must know the types of transfer pricing and the various actions that a commissioner general can take if there is a transfer pricing uh, transaction at the end of the day in that that case so that we know exactly what must be done uh, by the Commissioner General in that regard. So standard tax planning measures at this level, if you check your syllabus, if you check your syllabus, there is there is a portion that is titled about 90% and that is uh, not 90%, 60% and that is the standard tax planning where various investments, various issues, various scenarios, various treatments are established there. So you want to make sure that you familiarize yourself very well with all all these things that I've mentioned and many, many more. And that is what makes advanced taxation very interesting because, I mean, I love it a lot because these areas are critical, they are interesting, and the more you learn them, but the more you understand them, the more you're able to familiarize yourself with them, and the more you enjoy the way the treatments are done relating to each of them. So that is going to be uh, very critical for us. So corporate tax liabilities, um, capital allowance, standard tax planning measures. Remember under the standard tax planning measures also, we could chip in the issue about double taxation. So you want to make sure you understand the principles that underline double taxation. Okay, um, we have the credit rated method, we have the uh, relinquish method approach by companies usually and uh, you must know the kind of the type of countries that Ghana has a double taxation arrangement with and then the various computation that must be done to get a double taxation or uh, a double tax credit relief, the requirements that must be met, the processes that must go, we must go through, all these things are critical. Okay, it sounds a lot. You, some of you are saying that we're all in Shira. It sounds a lot. It looks a lot. But hey, it's not a lot. It's really interesting. It's one of my favorite, favorite areas when it comes to advanced taxation uh, as a whole. So that is very critical there that we must understand. So corporate tax, uh, capital allowance, mining, oil exploration, standard tax planning measures, very critical area. Then the last part is going to be uh, um, communication. Okay, you have to be mindful. The way you write your answer here is very, very critical because if the examiner says write a memo, you have to follow the pro forma of a memo. If the examiner says write a report, you must follow the pro forma of a report. And it is very, very critical. So anytime the examiner asks you, explain the tax implication of something, there is a way you have to go about it. There must be an introduction. You bring in the tax issue. What is the law saying? What does the act say about the transaction? Then you contextualize the transaction. Then you give a conclusion paragraph. And that is very, very critical. So if you are going into the exam hall for advanced taxation, these are the few issues that I believe you have to focus on. And if you do, you will go to the exam hall and shine bright and most importantly, pass the examination. And that is what you need to understand about advanced taxation as well. So in putting these two together, principles of taxation on one side, advanced taxation on the other side, what I want you to know, what I want you to uh, pay attention to always is that the principles are going to be very critical here. Now, if you're a follower of my work or you are one of our students, you're my student, you're enrolled in these courses, we have our tax principle document that is uh, given to you and is updated because that becomes like literally your Bible that gives you the description, the principles that you have to focus on on the various issues. And I want to make I want you to really pay attention to that document very well. Hold that document truly to yourself and make sure you understand all the principles to the core. But in the exam hall, you want to make sure you take your time as you read the questions. Because as you read the questions, uh, you must understand the requirement to avoid digression. You must understand the requirements very well to avoid digression. I believe that if you do this uh, and focus on these very well, you will be able to definitely pass the examination. So if there are any questions you have, put them in the comment section for me. Put them in the uh, chat also if you are watching this, uh, the premiere uh, of the video. Then also make sure that you uh, share the video. Let's reach as many students as possible. Let me know. 
which of these topics would you want me to treat on the live stream or would you want me to really dive a bit deeper or you would want more clarification on as we revise and prepare ourselves for the examination i would really be excited to have you on the live stream and also to discuss some of these things with you so that you can prepare well for the examination pass the exams and most importantly become successful the takeaway here is this that as you go into the exam hall please take your time to read the questions very well Take time to usually start with a written or comment questions first because the questions are going to be written and calculation questions. Usually some of the calculation questions come with some number of headaches that you would have to think about, things that must be included, things should, that, should not be exclu that should not be included. So you want to make sure that you go into the written parts of all the questions and then answer all the theories that may be available in the question because definitely there'll be theory there and take your time and write them very well and uh, make sure you position yourself in that case once you are done with that you can come to the computation aspect and then you work yourself out to pass the exams let me say that because this is going to have a lot of written and comment issues uh, when the examiner says or when the invigilators say get ready to stop work it means probably you have like five or 10 minutes uh, to go you check your clock quickly then you dive deeper drop your pen and try to read over the things that you have uh, done because uh, you you, you got to be careful not bring not uh, not bringing a word a letter or uh, um, something can change the interpretation of what exactly you are writing down so please make sure that you read over your work I don't care who tells you that I'll oh, forget and start writing no it's it's very important you safeguard in your own interest what you have written in the past or what you have written already rather than rushing through to get zero at the end of the day. So when they say get ready to stop work, drop your pen. I know that is going to be very hard for some of you, but it is wisdom. Make sure you do it. Drop your pen and scan read the theories that you've written down. Make sure that that was what you wanted to say because sometimes you'll be tempted you are writing. In your brain, you think you are writing, da, 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 but then the pen is producing a different thing. That is why you will need to make sure that you read over the things that you have uh, written before you actually submit your script to the examiner. I believe that if you do these, you can pass the principles of taxation exams or the advanced taxation examination. I'll see you in another broadcast as we continue with our discussion. Stay safe and take care. Bye-bye.